everybody, welcome. Welcome to a presentation on two joyous topics. Yeah. Yeah. Tom and All right, well, let me just kind of introduce myself. I have kind of a convoluted background. Um, I'm actually from Michigan, and I'm from Owasso, and I spent many years as a prosecutor in Ingham County. And for any of you who were involved in the, well, it really was 2000 to 2003 pound seizure campaign, that was through an organization that I co-founded called Friends of Lincoln County Animal Shelter, of which Howie was also associated with. Um, so I spent a lot of time as a prosecutor, spent a lot of time volunteering at the animal control shelter there, and that's how I learned about pound seizure the hard way. Um, after leaving Ingham County, I went to Washington, D.C. area where I worked for the National District Attorneys Association. From there, I ended up going to the American Humane Association and heading their legislative office. And one of the first things I did when I landed there was I sat at my desk and said, Michigan is going to end pound seizure and gas chambers, and I'm now in a position to do something and put some backing behind it. Yeah. And we all oh, got so close. Oh, we got so close. It's maddening. It's maddening. Um, but I, I wrote the pound seizure bill that was filed in early 2009, and it went all the way through the House and then it died in the Senate, and then worked on the uh, gas chamber language along with Michigan Pet Farm, and the same thing happened there. So that was discouraging, but entertaining and educating. Well, now I'm back at the National District Attorneys Association and I'm creating a program of training prosecutors on animal cruelty <coughs> issues because they don't have the training. So I'm trying to get that out. Um, in my volunteer time, I'm the vice president of No Paws Left Behind. It's a national group that deals with foreclosure pets and we try to get them out to rescues um, and to shelters who will adopt them. I like that adoption guarantee language. So we get them out to adoption guarantee. <laughs> shelters before they are seized um, by animal control. Um, I'm part of the Michigan State Bar Animal Law Section, um, past president and co-founder of FICUS, and I'm with King Street Cats now, which is a, just the cutest little free-roaming cat orphanage, we don't call it a shelter, um, in Alexandria, Virginia, and I have a lot of fun with that. And together with Holly and Jill Fritz, and Debbie Schott and Wendy Swift, who is with the uh, Humane Society of Kent County. We co-founded Michigan for Shelter for Pets, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. And I've just done far too many trainings, but this is what I do. This is what I love. Um, and I also published a book uh, just a few months ago. If you really want to know the ins and outs of pound seizure and really get involved to help us end this once and for all, please, I have the book here. It's at a significantly reduced rate. It's cheaper than Amazon. so. Um, I encourage you, please get this and read it. Um, it'll really educate you on what's going on. So just very, very briefly, um, before I get to the actual topic, I just want to go through and explain how incredibly powerful you are. You have no idea how powerful you are. And this is what I learned at, when I was uh, Vice President of Public Policy for American Humane. I could sit in my office in the greater DC area and come up with strategy and you know things to do and what good is that in Michigan? It wasn't good unless you all got involved. And so I really learned the power, I mean we all know that, but I really learned the power of local grassroots advocacy because you're the ones that are going to vote people out of office. And just looking at the elections this past November, holy oh cow, did the people speak or what? You can vote people out of office. I've seen this at the county level in Ingham County, right before we began pound seizure. We took county commissioners out and we replaced them with pet friendly ones. That's how we won. So you are very powerful. We need you. We can't do this. Even with this Michigan for Shelters Pets Coalition, we need you. So please, you know, get involved. And I always ask people to decide are you an activist or are you an advocate? And a lot of people are like, well, what's the difference? Okay, conjure up in your mind what is the image of an animal activist? <laughs> that's what the legislators and that's what the county commissioners are thinking when they label you an animal activist. And it's sad because animal activists are some of the most powerful people that I've ever met. But when you say animal advocate, kind of has a different feel to it, right? 
So I'm very careful about what I'm called, even though last week in our local paper, on a story that had nothing to do with really advocacy, I was labeled Allie Phillips, an animal activist. And I went up to the reporter afterwards, and I'm like, really? What? I mean, th this was about a, a rescue transport program. It's like, what? 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 Why'd you call me that? Oh, well, isn't that what you are? So I had to educate him. So when we're going out, when we're lobbying, when we're talking to legislators, tell them up front, I'm an animal advocate. You know, and I'm here to talk to you about blah, 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 bills. And that instantly puts them at ease. Because if you show up, I'm an animal activist, boom. They think you're tying yourself to a tree and you're going to throw blood on them. Uh, and that's the image that they get. And that's the image that they want to portray to their colleagues to discredit us. You may also get the question, are you animal rights or animal welfare? And to me, it's about animal protection. So that's the word that I like to use because when people hear animal rights, again, they think, oh, you're an extremist. You're going around and you're bombing buildings. That's not true. We don't do that. I mean, do we really know anybody personally who's done that? No, that's their image. So really, all of this is about image. It's about credibility when they're going out there as a citizen advocate. Action alerts are, are very powerful. And I know Jill sends them out. We're going to be sending them out to Michiganders for shelter pets. We're going to literally activate you when you need to take action. And it could simply be, hey, the bill's got filed. We need you to go and tell five friends. And then two weeks later, you may get an email that says, hey, talk to your, your own veterinarian. Not you personally have a veterinarian, but your pets. <laughs> but have you talked to your vet? And then have you gone to you know, your favorite pet store or your favorite business? And we're going to spread this like wildfire throughout Michigan. Um, so please sign up to get these action alerts. And we may ask you to make phone calls <coughs> to your legislator, because there is nothing more powerful for you to contact your senator and your representative and say, I need you to support this bill. I need you to vote for it. And I need to educate you on it. All the materials are on the table out front. They are also on the voice list. Uh, Michigan for Shelter Pets website. You can download it. We put everything together so that you literally don't have to use a brain cell at all. We want you to use your energy to focus on getting this message out. So we've created the materials for you. We want you to meet with your legislators. Whether you call them, write them, email them, you know, run into them at the corner, you know, coffee shop when they're <coughs> back in their home district. <coughs> you to meet with them. Because we need this grassroots movement. You know, five people can't do it. A hundred people can't even do it. We need tens of thousands of you to do this with us. Because we are never going to get to the goal if we have these two practices in our shelters. This is a stain on Michigan. It's horrifying. As I go across the country and talk about animal protection issues, I'm very proud to say Michigan has some of the best animal cruelty laws in the country, hands down. We have some of the worst animal sheltering laws in the country. And that is really embarrassing for me to say when I am in states who I know have worse laws, like West Virginia, Alabama, North Carolina, but yet their shelter laws are better than us. West Virginia's out outlawed gas chambers and home seizure by its name. So we need to do this. And then lobby days. Jill, you have a lobby day coming up, yes? April 13th. April 13th. Uh -huh. Sign up. This is very important to get together and to storm the Capitol. Really, learn the issue. When you learn these issues, you're very powerful. You're going to get ridiculous questions out of legislators. You need to be able to answer them. Again, these fact sheets that we put together have literally gone under transition for the last three years. We have put every ridiculous argument in there that you can imagine, and we've given you an answer. So just you know, use those. It's all there for you. <coughs> we need everybody to collaborate, to work together. This is not about who's going to win this, you know, who's done the most work. It's not, it's not about us. It's not about us. We, we need to band together. And there's always, you know, a handful of people who like to sit behind their computer and nitpick everything that we do, right? We all know those people that complain no matter what you do. You know what? Let them do whatever they need to do. We need to stay focused on what we're doing, and we will win. We will win this.
having credibility is so important when you're going out to laugh. Because if you say something that is not true, it will forever stick on you, and you will never get rid of that. So again, these fact sheets that we created have been fully vetted, fact checked, everything, everything is 100%, 1,000% factual. You can rely on it. And the one thing that I've, that I've learned, and for any of you who have lobbied, is when you go to a legislator or to a county commissioner or a city council, when you go in with high emotions, they get turned off, don't they? They really get turned off. That's kind of sad. So we come at it with facts, again, which is why we have these fact sheets. But when you do find kind of a kindred spirit, you know, in the legislature, then you go in with the emotion, here's a photo of, you know, Coney and the dog, and that hooks them. And then they're gonna go out and lobby for us. So, you know, kind of balance the facts with the emotions. And we have to learn what the opposition is doing, and I'm gonna go through that in a little bit. Um, because they come up, frankly, with ridiculous arguments. And it takes us about 8.3 seconds to defeat their arguments, and then they come up with another one. So, you know, rely on us, we're, we're doing that, we're vetting the information, we're gonna get the information to you. We need to get this out to the media. If any of you have any contacts with the media, we want to start getting op-eds in all the local newspapers. We've even written a sample one that as soon as these bills are filed, which is literally any day now, we got op-eds ready to go. We want all of you to slap your name on it, get it, get it in your local newspaper. Wouldn't that be amazing if all on the same day we have like half the Michigan newspapers running the same op-ed? Oh, fantastic. I've already talked a little bit about divisiveness, you know, the people that try to interfere with what we're doing. And I'm not talking about the opposition, I'm talking about people within our own ranks. Stay focused. I mean, if, if, if you have people like that that just nitpick everything that you do, everything that you're trying to do, you know, call us with Michiganders for Shelter Pets. We'll boost you up. You know, we're, we're all in the same game. You know, we've all been where you are. I mean, we've all been in the shelter, you know, dealing with this stuff. So, you know, we're here to boost each other out, not tear each other down. And these are long campaigns, so just please be patient. We're already two years plus, oh, more than that, on the pound seizure. I mean, the pound seizure, we started hitting pretty hard in 2003. You know, eight years later, we still don't have a state law, but we're getting there. You know, but above all, take care of yourself. Because if you're not strong and healthy and a good mental capacity, you know, what, what good are you? What good are you? So we need you to be strong. The animals need you to be strong. You know, I, I'm a big fan of going out in my backyard and just screaming. Of course, my neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, oh, God, what is she doing over there? Uh, but I want to kind of give you the beginning of how I got involved in pound seizure. And this was back in 2000, I started volunteering at Ingham County Animal Shelter. Not the shelter that Jamie runs now. This was. Um, I know you can all picture in your mind a very sad shelter that's gray and dingy and cold and the animals have nothing to sit on but newspaper. They have no toys, they're not getting walked. The shelter staff looks at you like, why are you here? Volunteer, are you crazy? But we did, we formed a volunteer group. And how I learned about the Class B dealers, which I'll get into in a second, is the, the gray kitty, and that's a horrible photo. It's the only photo that I have of her. She was literally taken out of my arms by a class B dealer. Oh. I thought he was an adopter. And I actually said to him, oh, are you adopting Lilac? And that's her little three-month-old son, Linus. Oh. And I'm like, oh, are you adopting Lilac? Would you consider Linus? I'm talking to a B dealer. Oh. Here, take Linus, you know? <laughs> and he, looked, he just looked at me with stone-cold eyes and said, she's going to save lives. And he walked out, and I, I mean, my heart actually just skipped me right now. Now, I think you might need to just quickly clarify what a B dealer is. Oh, yes, thank you. Story. For those of you that don't know, a, cl a Class B dealer is, is licensed by the USDA. They're animal brokers. There's nine of them in the country. Three are in Michigan. And what they do is they go trolling for random source animals. Random source animals just are randomly genetic. They're not purebred. So shelters are the best shopping grounds for Get three out of the nine because Michigan's just lucky. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it is. Michigan's just so lucky. Then wow. 
Yeah. Oh, what they do is they go into the shelters, they get the cats, and then they resell them for profit to research facilities, training um, clinics, biomedical research, cosmetic research, you name it. Anything that a human can do to an animal, they're reselling them for profit. This man took Lilac out of my hands. I ran to the shelter desk and said, who is that man? Is he adopting her? Nobody would answer me. I then started screaming, I will pay. It was a $30 adoption fee. I'm like, here's 30 bucks. And here's another 30 for Linus. I will take her. They ignored me. They actually ignored me. I then ran out the back door and saw him leaving with his wife. And that's when I learned what a video was. I've never been the same. I've never been the same. So, Palm seizure. Okay, th this is where these dealers go in and research facilities can go into a shelter and take a cat or dog for research. Under Michigan law, they are allowed to do this. There are, like I said, nine in the entire country. Eight are in the eastern half of the United States. Three are in Michigan. Now, what is different about when I say Class D dealer, there are actually 29 Class D dealers in Michigan, but they don't all do this. A class B dealer is one who transports animals back and forth. The random source, these nine, are the ones that are not only transporting, but they're going in and getting them. It's these nine that we really have to watch. The class A dealers are the ones that are breeding animals. If you're a breeder, you have to have a class A license. At the federal level, we have the Animal Welfare Act that says that a shelter has to hold, regardless of your state law, has to hold a pet for five days before you give it to a dealer or a research facility. So in Michigan, where we have a law that says you can hold a pet that has identification, a collar, a microchip, what have you, you can hold them for four days, you still have to hold one extra day before you can send that pet to research. Massive violations here in Michigan on that people have trouble understanding the timeline. There are even additional rules beyond this that say once the dealer has the animal, the dealer has to hold the pet for an additional 10 days. And why this is, is that the federal government recognized that stolen pets, family pets, lost family pets, were ending up in the research industry. They wanted to give families time to find them. But here's the glitch. So there's nine Class B dealers. We have research facilities all over the country. The animals are being transported out of state. Do you really think you're going to find your dog that went missing in Macosta County when it's on a transport bus down the University of Florida? No, you're not. It's not going to happen. So what the USDA is doing as of September 2009 is a mandatory traceback protocol where they go in for an on-site quarterly inspection, and what they do is they just randomly pick you know, anywhere from five to ten of the animals that are on site at that moment, and they have to literally trace them back to their origin, and they better find the owner. And there's very strict rules on where meat dealers can get animals from. Shelters, breeders, people who raise and breed animals on their property, they cannot get them from pretty good home ads. They can't get them from individual people. They can't get them as strays. Can't they do that if they do a surrender form? No. The person they has to anymore? say that I bred and raised this animal okay. on my property. How many can say that? You can't. Good question. How do they know that they're not doing it? That this that the video is not giving them um, the variety for you. They're catching them. They're catching them. Because they're doing these trace backs now. They're going in quarterly. If any of you ever want to trace um, what the Class B dealers are doing and what citations they are getting, email me. I will send you the link to the USDA website where they publicly post all the violations. And there's one B dealer in Michigan who has heavily violated this. He's getting animals from improper locations. Kim Woodenberg. Yeah. As in late research. September of 2010, he was cited for three dogs on the property that they couldn't trace yes. that. Yeah. 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 And I have some good news. Literally just learned this about an hour ago. With about three years worth of citations for violating the Animal Welfare Act and wondering when is USDA going to move on a federal indictment on our research, they have sent the complaint to the Office of General Counsel. It may still be another two months, two years, but it is in the hands of the federal prosecutors to federally indict Jim Ludenberg with our research. So, yay! <laughs>
and these are long investigations, it's painful. Now, Michigan, we have our own law that says shelters may give animals to research. You don't have to, it's your decision. You can charge up to $10 per animal. Um, research facilities can, can go in and get them from the shelters, they can get them from the dealers, they can get them from the breeders, they can get them from a wide variety of places. And that's what we see, the dealers go into the shelter, get the pets, and then sell them to Lake Michigan State or University of Michigan or out of state. And if they violate the, violate this and get it from an improper source, it can be a misdemeanor. And again, like I said before, shelters must keep the animals for at least four days or seven. But that federal law trumps it, and you have to keep them five days before you sell them um, to research. Just to give you a national overview, two states actually mandate this, Minnesota and Oklahoma, that if a research facility goes into a shelter in one of those states, the shelter cannot turn them away. Minnesota just filed their bill two weeks ago to end this practice. Oklahoma is really holding firm because they're trying to actually expand and give greater, um, greater rights to the pound seizure um, research facility. So Oklahoma is a hard fought to <coughs> But But uh, 18 states prohibit this. We need to make Michigan number 19. We need to be next. I think Minnesota will be 19 and we'll be number 20. So in 2003, when we're, you know, hot and heavy in Ingham County doing a very vicious battle, there were actually 15 shelters in the state that engaged in pound seizure. We have it down to two today, Matasta and Gratia. Um, look at all those shelters that got rid of it. Jackson, Eaton, Judy here in Eaton, look, raise your hand. Yep, very, very instrumental in Eaton County. Montcalm was a vicious battle two years ago, and then Osceola quietly got rid of the practice. Here's the problem, because a lot of people say, well, we only have two shelters left. Why do we need a state law? What do you think the bee dealers are doing? Seeing that, holy crap, we only have Christian and Macosta. They're going to worm their way into other counties that really don't know what this is. When Jackson banned the bee dealer in 2006, what did that bee dealer do? He snuck his way into Gladwin. And before the rescue people could find out, he had gotten two weeks worth of animals, and then they mobilized and they kicked his butt out of there very quickly. That's what's going on. Be vigilant. Be vigilant. we got to get this out to everybody. That's why everybody's got to read this, please. we got to get this out there. They're squirming their way in. We're taking their financial livelihood. I mean, if somebody took your financial livelihood, wouldn't you fight? Yeah? They're fighting. We have to stop them. So here's the numbers of Michigan cats and dogs that have been victims of pound seizure. In 2004, over 2,300 were lost. 2009, we got it down to a little over 300. That is huge. That's because of all of you. That's everybody. Look at that. All the rescue groups going in and saying, you're not taking these cats and dogs. Literally taking them out of the supply chain. We don't have the 2010 numbers. They literally should be available in the next week or two. So we're dwindling, but for those 329 cats and dogs, their life, as they knew it came to an end, they were not bred for research. They were not meant to be handled by strangers, poked and prodded in a cage without their natural behaviors. Those 329 cats don't even want to think of what happened. And for the rescue groups that were in those shelters for those 329 pets, it's heartbreaking. It's, it's heartbreaking to have the lilacs of the world taken out of their arms. Look at that cat. Who wouldn't want to adopt that cat? She was a victim of pound seizure last year. And what we find is, luckily, there is this dwindling practice. You know, we, we find that about 9% of all research animals are cats and dogs, but only 0.3% are actually bee dealer shelter cats and dogs. So it's a very, very small percentage, and it's powerful when the medical industry comes to us and says, oh my God, yeah. we're never going to cure cancer without flea-ridden Fido. Mm -hmm. Really? Real. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you're not getting a lot of pets. They're not using the random source pets. They're not wanting the shelter pets. That's our strongest argument. The research industry is saying, we don't, we don't want them. We don't have supply. Great. Then 
and look, let's close this, let's close shop and not do this anymore. That is powerful. Because look at what it was in 1977. Look at how many dogs and cats were in research. 176,000 dogs, 62,000 cats. Huge lowering of the number. This is our one of our most powerful arguments. Congress um, came forward in 2009 and um, ordered a congressional study on, you know, are random source animals, shelter pets, really used in research? Do we really need these Class B dealers? And you know what they said? Class B dealers are not needed to supply these animals. Brilliant. We couldn't have asked for a better result. We don't need them. It's why we're down to nine. But we still got to get rid of them. And then the Government Accountability Office in D.C. came forward just six months ago and said, you know what, USDA? you got to start keeping your costs of what it takes to investigate and oversee these Class B dealers, because we all know it's a huge number. It's a huge. The USDA themselves have testified that they spend more money on these nine Class B dealers than the other 10,000 licensees that they have. That's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. That's powerful. The government is telling us that. And they also found that 13% of those tracebacks to get to the original owner are incomplete and USDA is doing nothing about it. So. And they're also concerned that these bee dealers have repeat sellers. The same people are giving the cats and dogs. Well, in our world, that's a buncher. A buncher is somebody who goes out and literally bunches up the animals because they're not governed by USDA, so they're getting them from Craigslist. Pretty good home ads. Hey, little doggy on the street. Oh, hey, little doggy tied up at Starbucks. Why don't you come with me? I cringe when I see that. I go in and find those people and say, I can have your dog in my car and I'll do a research lab in two seconds flat. And I bet they never do it again. The bunchers are gathering the animals, selling them to the bee dealers. Congress has a big problem with that. So we're getting some good support for this. The Pet Safety and Protection Act is a federal bill that has been filed, sadly, for the last 10 federal legislative sessions and has, hasn't gone anywhere. And sadly, it hasn't even been filed yet at the beginning of this session. And the way things are going, I mean, we're talking about closing down the federal government. It's all I hear in the D.C. area right now. So I don't know when they're going to file this. But that bill actually doesn't get rid of pound seizure. All it says is, if you are a federal research facility, like National Institutes of Health, you will not get your federal money if you take animals from a bee dealer. MSU gets federal money. U of M gets federal money. Wayne State gets federal money. You can see where we're going here? It's kind of a nifty little way to come around one end while we come around the other. Okay. So this is all very strategic, what's going on. I mentioned in 2003 there was an a anti pound seizure bill that was filed coming right out of the Ingham County success. And sadly, that was um, actually killed by one of our own people. And I won't say anything more about that. <laughs> um, 2007, HSUS introduced the pound seizure bill. And uh, we're not quite sure why it happened, but the sponsor actually turned on the bill. And turned against it. It's kind of scary. Um, so in 2009, um, I I wrote a new pound seizure bill that I felt was really good because it not only gave an exemption for vet schools to do spay neuter out of shelters, and if a dog gets hit by a car, to help that dog and then put the dog back in shelter. By the way, all of that is pound seizure when you're taking a shelter pet to experiment. Spay neuter can be an experimentation for a vet student. That's pound seizure. We wrote in these beautiful exemptions. It was a beautiful bill. It got vetted with so many people. And then we had to amend it because the Michigan Veterinary Medical Association and the Farm Bureau um, threw a hissy fit. So what it's changed to now and what we're going to refile it very soon, very soon with um, Senator Warren, is the first year that this bill is law, the only animals that can, that can be victims of pound seizure are where the person surrendering the pet, not a stray, but the owner says, you may use my cat or dog in research. They have to say it. 
thereafter, we just outright ban the bee dealer, but it allows the research facilities to go in. But I have to tell you, we're not going to go in. They, they want to be one step removed from this. They do not want to go trolling the shelters looking for their next experimentation subject. That's why they pay the bee dealers. That's why they pay the middlemen. So this may not be the, the most perfect language, but this is the language that we feel can pass. So we're very excited. Um, I mean, literally any day now, we're going to get word that this has been filed. And Jill is, is she's like like a rabid dog. She's all over this, <laughs> making sure that this is going to get filed. The last legislative session, look at the support that we had. 10,000 of you on a, the online petition, we had almost 60,000 people. People from Turkey were really angry that this was going on in Michigan. And it's like, thank you, but yeah, that's not going to help here in Michigan. Know, the Michigan legislators are not going to care what somebody in Iceland or Argentina thinks. So I narrowed it down and it was 10,000 Michigan people. Mm -hmm. But look at all the shelters and the rescue groups, 120, 116 businesses, 42 vets. We have to do better. Mm -hmm. We have to do better. Yeah. 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 And I mean, this was powerful. I loved putting this in front of the legislators to say, look at all of these people who are going to take your job. We have to do this quickly, quickly. So I mean, seriously, I beg of you, go home, send an email to everybody that you know, ask them to sign up as a citizen advocate on our website because you will be in that 10,000. I want that to be more like 25,000. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to have 200 shelters and rescue groups, 200 businesses, 200 veterinarians. We need big numbers. So we need all of you to help us with that. We're going to have a battle this year, I'll tell you. It's, I don't think the legislature is as friendly as it was last year. It's not good. And so we are going to have to use sheer force. Doing the right thing is not going to happen in Lansing. Us bugging them, you know, giving them emails, calling them, showing up, lobby days, to the point where they say, okay, fine, I give up. <laughs> Sadly, we'll take, we'll take a win however we can get it. That's what we need to do. Here's our opposition. I bet the first one surprises you. No. 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 I tell you, it surprised me. It surprised me because I'm one of these naive people. Oh, veterinarians love animals. Yeah. And most of them do. And actually, all of them do. But when it comes to the politics of especially animals and research, I think we all can understand they want to practice in school on what's going to be their client. I think we all want them to practice, but you know what? You can practice and not kill them. You can, you can practice doing a neuter, bring the dog out of anesthesia, don't kill him. I mean, that sounds simple, right? So we want to work with them, but it's been virtually impossible because of their lobbyists. The Farm Bureau, why are they getting involved in a bill that involves shelter cats and dogs? We're not talking about pigs or cows. Why are they getting involved? Slippery slope. I tell you, Cedar Point better name a ride Slippery Slope because I'm going to be the first one to go down it. That's what they're saying. So, okay, so here's a challenge. This is what I said to the Farm Bureau lobbyists last year. This is a shelter cats and dog bill. This is not an agriculture bill. This is not a farm animal bill. It's not a factory farm bill. We'll keep our nose out of your business. You keep your nose out of ours. She was not willing to agree. So, I don't know, wouldn't, wouldn't it be fun to file a factory farm bill? We already let's, did. <laughs> let's keep them busy. Let's keep them so busy that they don't see this coming and they don't bother us on that. I think we got to find a way to keep them busy. It will be hard because we already we just passed the bill to ban battery cages and the station crates and wheel crates, so there there's really else? nowhere else to go. <laughs> oh, there's mm -hmm. nothing else you can well, yeah. do. Well, yeah, do a tail docking bill or yeah, just something you know, to keep them busy <laughs> because they're putting their nose in our business. But yet we all know they hate it when we put our nose in their business. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you know what? They want to stick our nose in their business. Yeah. You know, we're going to play a little game with them. Um, Department of Agriculture, surprisingly. Um, was opposed to this. And I think they were worried about the oversight. And I actually said to them, there will be no oversight if there's a ban, period. It's done. Um, University of Michigan has one doctor. 
that was, you know, very passionate that he needs his older dogs to do his, to do his research. Mm -hmm. And who is this doctor? <laughs> Dr. Rush. Dr. Rush, who is also, um, from what we can tell, um, an associate of r and Research. Mm -hmm. Is it R-O-U? Oh. U of M Medical School? R-U-S-H. Pardon? R-U-S-H. Rush. R-U-S-H, yes. 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 I thought that was just on the news last year that they stopped using. Only in one class, the Advanced Trauma Life Support class. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And then, of course, the class be dealing with. But they were, they were pretty quiet last session, <coughs> which was nice. So this is why we need a new law. I mean, yeah, we only have two shelters. I don't know. Do we? Have they squirmed their way into more? We're going to find out when we see the 2010 shelter reports any day now. But what we find is that some shelters actually give priority to the dealer over a rescue group who is standing at the shelter front door waiting for the shelter to open. And the B dealer came in the back door and out the back door. And that pet never had one second where they were eligible for adoption because they took them on the first day before the shelter even opened. That happened. It happened in Ingham. It happened in Montcalm. And doesn't it make you wonder, what's going on? It makes me wonder why I wrote this book. I need to expose all of that, what's going on. It just undermines an animal shelter. We are never going to get to the goal if we have this practice. We're never, never going to get there. We have to get rid of these bad practices. And then we can focus on all this other great stuff, but we have got to do this. It's just an embarrassment. <coughs> it really is. It's an embarrassment. I can't believe we have to advocate for this. Yeah. It's crazy. So here's a couple of stories. <coughs> a man escaped from his yard in Hillsdale County in 2006 while his family was on vacation. Pet sitter let him out in the backyard and run around and play. And Conan was like, freedom! <laughs> Over the fence, boom. They were right on the county line to Jackson. Pet sitter didn't even think of calling Jackson Conan. <coughs> Conan got picked up, ended up there. Five days later, literally, after the minimum hold, sold to a video. Then the family came home from vacation. Here's the kicker. Get a raise. Did the shelter check it? Nope. Did the bee dealer check it? Nope. Last chance for animals did an undercover investigation. That's the undercover photo of Conan at the bee dealer facility with the tag. I talk about it in, in my book. What they did with that tag. How it ended up in a big garbage can filled with other tags. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He was sold to a New York research facility. He was killed before his family could save him. Now, this is why I say no pet in Michigan is safe, because this could happen to anybody. This could happen to anybody. Somebody, even if you live here in Washtenaw County, you know, hours away from a pound seizure shelter, who's to see a bunch of isn't going to pick up your pet and transport you? No pet is safe. Yes, you had a question. In that case, I mean, could a family go and sue the shelter and go after the Class B dealer? if tags were on this animal? And what about the case of like a microchip or something? You could try. It really hasn't been done, to my knowledge, but you could try. Ionia County did get one dog back. I'm going to talk about okay. this dog. Yep, yep. Yeah, we actually did have an extra story. So we encourage people to call in abuse and neglect, right? We want them to. We want these pets to be out of abusive homes. Well, Chance and his siblings were in a neglectful home, and a good Samaritan called up Jackson County Animal Control, which, by the way, doesn't do this anymore. But at the time, they went, they picked up the dogs. Five days later, all of them were sold to a bee dealer, including little Chance. Look how terrified he is. <laughs> this is simultaneous with not only rescue groups, but adopters wanting Chance and his dogs. <coughs> they were beautiful, beautiful golden dogs. And the shelter and the dealer actually went back and forth and thought, well, who, who actually can give them up? I mean, they're in the hands of the dealer. Can we give them up or can the shelter? And by the time they were exhausting themselves with that, they sold them to a research facility. 
that that's just that's just so beyond wrong. Those animals were betrayed twice. They were neglected and then they were seized in Tom Sutter. Here's mittens. Is this the case you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, mittens. No. mittens. Uh, this really turned out very well, but mittens was adopted out of Ionia and then somehow ended up in Montcalm. And uh, an Ionia volunteer looked and said, wait a minute, I think this is mittens. I think this is mittens. And so Ionia called and said, hey, this is our dog. We have a contract that says the dog comes back to us. You know, we're going to come get her. Well, after the minimum hold period, did they hold mittens for Ionia? No, they sold her to a bee dealer. And luckily, holy hell, was raised, and USDA got involved, and calls were made, and mittens was retrieved. But, I mean, that shouldn't have happened. Why? Why would a shelter do that? Money. Yeah. Shelter didn't get money for selling that dog. Somebody, somebody, yeah. Somebody, somebody, somebody money. Yeah. 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 Makes you go, hmm, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 Somebody's getting money. Pets get, about 5 million pets get stolen every year. Rusty here was stolen from her yard in Florida in 2005. How she ended up at Montcalm County Animal Control in 2008 is anyone's guess. Where was she for three years? What happened to her? Well, she was sold to a Class B dealer, and this still baffles me, but the B dealer saw that she had a tattoo on her ear. He called Tattoo a Pet to find out who's the registered owner but used a false name. Didn't say he was a bee dealer. And to a pet, had caller ID. Knew exactly who was calling. Yeah. And, and then Justine, a tattoo pet, you do not want to mess with her. She is one feisty chick. And she told him right on the phone, I know exactly who you are. She hung up. She found the owner. The owner said, get my dog out of here got it all arranged, ended up getting Rusty back, and Rusty went to a rescue group in Kalamazoo. Again, a lot of a lot of moving parts where animals are slipping through the cracks. This is any of these scenarios could happen to any one of us. This is why it's got to All right, now we're on to gas chambers, because I have about 20 minutes left. So you're probably wondering why are we talking about banning gas chambers when we're just trying to talk about no more euthanasia? Well like what's been said, there are going to be some shelter pets that need to be euthanized. You know, a dog that comes in severely injured, maybe was the bait dog in the dog fighting ring, and there's nothing that you can do. Do you want to gas them? No. We got to end this. Michigan's euthanasia law is not exactly strict. <laughs> um, you know, with eight hours of training, you too can learn how to euthanize animals. There you go. But that's only the injection method. If you want to gas, there's really no training. You can actually just take a barrel and hook your car exhaust up and go at it. Have fun with that. The only thing Michigan does say is you can't use a high altitude decompression chamber or electrocution. It doesn't say anything about drowning. We won't get into the whole wildlife issue. That's a whole bigger thing. So what we have are eight shelters right now. This is lower from last year. We're making progress. Eight still gas. <laughs> Ratchet and Macosta are, are the, uh, the double threats. They have gas and anesthesia. Yeah. So we need to help the groups in those counties. The rescue groups are in those counties are really trying so hard. They got a double threat they're going up against. But what is very interesting is that all of them, except for Macosta and Huron, have been trained, when I say EBI, that's euthanasia by injection, they've either been trained in EBI, or they actually have the equipment. They have the backup system. It's easier to throw an animal in a chamber and walk away, rather than hold this frightened animal in its last moments of life. They just want to throw them in. And that's the argument that we get. Oh, it's easier, you just throw them in, flip the switch, walk away, come back 25 minutes later. Yeah, well, you know, in that 25 minutes, their organs have shut down, but they're alert. You know how painful that must be? Whereas euthanasia by injection, within three to five seconds, they're already on So it's like, no, we, we, we have to end this. We have to end this. All other shelters in Michigan, 
are using injection. Can't tell me it's difficult. Can't tell me you don't have the training or the money. We can do this. And I'm going to talk about the money in a bit. Yes, you had a question. Um, and I know in the South, the big problem with gas chambers is yes. that they were throwing so many dogs yes. and cats. Is that a problem with these shelters, or do we know if it is? Nobody will admit it. Nobody will admit it. We have every reason to believe. We actually need somebody in a gassing shelter to send us a photo. So I'm just kind of putting that out. Just putting that out. Yeah, I mean, we, we have no recent evidence of that. We have evidence of mass from 10 years ago, where they're clawing each other to death in the chamber. We don't have evidence of that now. So I can't say either way. <laughs> I'm a good colorist. <laughs> yeah. I'm a good colorist. Look at that dog. Oh. oh. Can't even look at it. So here are the legislative efforts. Um, in the last legislative session, Michigan has two year sessions. We, we go along with the federal government, so we have two year sessions. So we have two years to get these passed. So in 2009, 2010, Rick Jones and Fred Miller filed the anti-gas chamber legislation. They were extremely passionate about this, very powerful. We <coughs> got it through the house. We got policy through the house. Um, and what was the beauty of it was that it was not only a ban on shelters, but on bee dealers. And you're probably thinking, well, why are you throwing bee dealers into the gas chamber legislation? It just yeah, slipped yeah. in. We have one bee dealer where we have information that he's using the gassing method. And he's using dioxide. It's not, not that I want to say that there's good gassing or bad gassing. Yeah, bad gassing, but it is a bad gassing. It's like an oil barrel. I'm trained. I don't know anybody who trains on gassing. So that's why we added that in there. Now, um, the language is getting refiled. Um, Rick Jones has now gone to the Senate. And mm -hmm. Steve Bita. He is a senator. Steve Bita is a senator. Oh, he is a senator? senator. Oh, I thought senator he was Bita. still around. No, this time he's a senator. Oh, great. Okay, I need to correct that. Thank you. So we have we have the bills being filed, and and literally we, we think any day now they're going to be filed. So please stay tuned because we then have to get the ground running to get this going. And these are two very good legislators we have. Give us the support. The last legislative session again. Look, over ten thousand people supported this. The online petition had over 86,000. Again, thank you, Cuba, for supporting our efforts. <laughs> Michigan legislators just weren't looking at you. They're looking at the Michigan people. Um, what, what was kind of hard on this was that people and organizations are a little hesitant to sign on to a bill involving euthanizing animals. And even though we'd say, look, this is we're getting rid of the really bad Euthanasia. I don't even want to call it inhumane. I mean, just, there's so many definitions of inhumane. I mean, we don't even really know what that means anymore. So I, I just call it bad. It's the bad type of putting an animal to sleep. A lot of organizations. On the policy issue bill, we had 10 national groups. On this one, we only had five because some just don't want to be associated. We have to get out there and get everybody on board. Because there are going to be times when, it, when a shelter pet does need to be humanely euthanized. We can't do it in a gas chamber. We just cannot do that to them. And we get arguments, well, what about a feral animal? OK, so here, I want to put a picture in your mind. Imagine the most feral cat or dog you've ever seen in your life. So here's the cage. Here's the gas chamber. Put on your gloves. You're going to reach into that cage for that feral animal? fully alert, wanting to kill you, and you're going to drag that animal into a gas chamber, somehow let go of that animal and shut the door, turn the gas on? That's the most dangerous way to do it. The safest way is to anesthetize that animal. And you can put, you can put it right in their food. You can do a whole syringe and inject them, and they just fall asleep. Well, while they're asleep, just finish the injection. Don't throw them in a gas chamber. But yet, the Veterinary Medical Society will actually argue that it's safer to grab the feral animal and put them in a chamber. And I think we all know that that, I mean, logically, that's not right. 
That's not right. Again, all of these arguments we have in the fact sheet, there's a lot of ridiculous arguments. There's our opposition. Gee, we see some common thread. I think they don't like us. But that's the common thread. Again, these bills are specifically, these are shelter bills, these are not veterinary bills. These are shelter cat and dog bills. These are not when the shelter happens to get a goat or a pig. Again, why are they getting involved? Now, Michigan Department of Agriculture, I will give you, has a legitimate concern. Who's going to fund this? Who's going to help these shelters transition? Well, I'll tell you, there's a very generous donor here in Michigan who, while I was at American Humane, gave an amazingly generous grant to help transition all of these shelters. Not only give them the supplies to do injection, give them the training for free, but actually take the gas chamber and buy it back so that they can't say, oh, we lost money on the gas chamber. You know what? It's, it's a gas chamber buyback program. There is no funding concerns whatsoever. So these eight shelters have been offered, and these eight shelters have not taken the offers. Why? But, but it's not a money concern. And, oh, and I gotta tell you this, I didn't put this on the slide. Um, there was a study done when I was at American Humane on is it cheaper to use gas or injection? Injection is cheaper than almost by half. So they can't say, okay, we're gonna set you up free, we're gonna train you free, we're gonna give you all the supplies for free. They may come back and say, oh, but then the continuing costs. Well, you know what, there's a study and we have it available to give to you that shows injection is cheaper. There are no funding concerns. Do you think the reason they have so few veterinarians I mean 41 and there's got to be there's hundreds, lot, hundreds yeah. in the state uh, do you think that they're concerned with the way that the veterinarian association views this I mean a political thing yes. shouldn't we all try to get to talk to our vet absolutely please talk to your vet because this is what happened um, when we started this endorsement campaign two years ago um, we got 40 vets right right off the bat because seriously, do you know who got the gas chamber? Uh -huh. <laughs> no. So they're very supportive of this. And actually, for the shelters that are transitioning for those few months, they're going to use a veterinarian for help. It's actually in the vet's best interest to support this bill financially. But then an email did come out from MDMA saying that they do not support this bill. And I actually had one veterinarian call me and say, please take my name off the list. Why? She said, I just, I just feel very threatened. I'm like, it's a membership organization. What are they going to no, do? She said, I don't need any trouble. I'm a new vet. I don't need any trouble. But the truth is, is the Michigan Veterinarian Medical Association is powerful. It's just like the American. It's just like the American Medical Association. They want to govern their own people, their own way. They don't want any outsiders telling them how to run their association. Exactly. That's the, the American Medical Association is the same way. You know, it's, like, it's, like, it's like they want to police they their own organization. They don't want anybody else. They want to tell everybody in their organization what to do. They don't want anybody outside saying anything. Well, and that's why we continue to say this is not a veterinary regulation bill. This bill doesn't use the word veterinarian at all in it. It's a shelter bill. The shelters should be livid at the MDMA. And the shelters collectively need to band with us to send a message to them. Get your nose out of our business. It has nothing to do with veterinary medicine. It has nothing to do with veterinary medicine at all. If anything, there is going to be a residual ripple effect that benefits them. So, yeah, you I make want, a good point. Well, I, and I want to say something about the Michigan Farm Bureau, too. Why I think they're... <laughs> 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 um, do you even know about the Dove Initiative? Yeah. Stop shooting doves? Well, you know who one of the biggest adversaries was in that were hunters? Because they were so afraid, yes. the minute you take away one hunting right, you're going to take away all hunting rights. Yes. Well, the Michigan Farm Bureau is worried because you're regulating one animal situation, yes. you're going to regulate all animal and situations. Oh, yeah. And they have a real reason to be afraid. But the language they do have a real reason to be afraid. Yes. Because they're doing wrong, and they know they're doing wrong, and they know that the public really knew yes. how wrong they were, that they wouldn't put up with them. Yeah. And that's why they're really coming out kicking and screaming. 
Sorry. And that's why, I mean, collectively, I like to believe there's more of us than there are of them. Have you ever thought about doing a petition drive like the dogs did? Like, yeah, we're scaring them about, scaring them about. I'd bring it up. I'd bring it up. I'd say, remember, save the dogs, folks. When the state of Michigan people made the decision, you were on the wrong side. We're not doing a ballot initiative because that takes hundreds of thousands of signatures, and you saw we only got ten thousand out of Michigan, and that was literally me and my staff working every day for two years, every day, and only ten thousand. Exactly. Come on. We can do better. Yes, we can do There's better. There's more you of us better. than there are them. That's why we need all of you. I need you all to go home within 24 hours and tell five friends and ask them to tell five friends. And then it's like that shampoo commercial in the 70s. And I tell two friends and so on and so on. Please, we need that desperately. Because I know we can do this. There are more of us. Because the majority of shelters have rejected this. I mean, you all wince when I talk about guessing. It has been rejected. And even Michigan Department of Ag says that carbon monoxide is dangerous to humans and it can pose a long-term health problem. They come out and said it. The science supports this. This is not just emotion. We have the science and the facts to back it. So this is what we have to do. And if you've never seen a gas chamber, that's a nicer version of a gas chamber. Imagine your last moments. Yeah. So this is what we've done. We have decided to really band together. Because you know what? It's not it's not about us anymore. It's, it's not about us. We can't be together. Please join this coalition, Michiganders for Shelter Pets. Voiceless Michigan is hosting the web page. And Holly is being a local girl, typing everybody's yeah. name in and getting everybody on there. But we will we need your support. We need to give you the materials. We need to ask you for help. We'll send you an, op uh, an opinion letter that's already been written. We will send you the fact sheets. You know, we'll ask you, call up your legislator, please. Or when they're in your district, you know, go to the local restaurant where they hang out and sit down and say, hey, I need to talk to you. And especially if your legislator is on the Agriculture Committee, which is where we suspect these bills are going to go. So we really need that. And if you want to join, I have a Facebook page called You Can Do More for Animals. Um, Michiganers for Shelter Pets has a Facebook page. Heck, everybody's got a Facebook page. But we just really need to be alert. If you hear that a shelter is engaging in pound seizure, if a bee dealer is sniffing around a shelter, or if all of a sudden you see a gas chamber, tell us. We will verify it. We want to make sure that we know what we're up against. So. All right, any questions? Look at that, two minutes to go. <laughs> I just had a comment. Yes. Um, I'll, of course, a lot of this has to do with medical research. Mm -hmm. But anytime I go out and buy laundry detergents or, or cosmetics or anything, I always make sure it's not tested on animals. And Look then I the also make the a comment to the person that I'm buying it from. But that's why I'm buying it. Yes, exactly. And I think that that's we an easy conscious. way for all of us to, you know, make sure you're not buying stuff that's You can get that list on, you know, PETA's website, which, or on American Animal Defense Council. Yeah. 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 Yeah